Hello and welcome everyone to Active Inference Lab to the Active Inference live stream. Today is March 9th, 2021, and we are in live stream 17.1. The Active Inference Lab is an experiment in online team communication, learning, and practice related to Active Inference. You can find us at the links and the contact mechanisms here. This is a recorded and an archived live stream, so please provide us with feedback so that we can be improving on our work. All backgrounds and perspectives are welcome here. And we'll be using good video etiquette for live streams, muting if we're not talking, raising our hands so that we can hear from everyone on the stack and using respectful speech behavior. Here we are today in 17.1, coming fresh off of our fun quarterly roundtable number one, and the first of two weeks discussing this paper with uh, the author, Chris Fields, and we're going to have a ton of time to get into it today and a follow-up discussion next week. Today, our goal is to discuss and learn this awesome paper and area, some areas that are probably new to everybody. And today in 17.1, we're just going to introduce ourselves, say hello, then Chris is going to give a presentation, and then we'll be able to ask questions and continue the discussion from there. So without further ado, we can get into the introductions and warm-ups. So everybody can just go around, we'll introduce ourselves, say hello, and then we can also consider these warm-up questions. So after introductions and anyone wanting to say something on a warm-up question, we'll go to Chris's presentation. So I'm Daniel, I'm a postdoc in California, and I'm excited today just to hear all of the things that we missed or messed in 17.0 and learn and uh, recalibrate and correct. And I'll pass it to Alex. Thanks. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Alex Vatkin. I'm in Moscow, Russia. I'm a researcher in systems management school and also co-organizer of Active Inference Lab. And I pass it to Scott. Thank you, Alex. Uh, my name is Scott David. I'm the director of the Information Risk Research Initiative at the University of Washington Applied Physics Lab. I'm super excited about the, the discussion today about information flows. We deal in, as the name sounds, in risk flows, and information and risk are really um, hand in hand. So this is going to be super exciting today. And I'll pass it to Siri. Uh, hi, my name is Sarah Davis. I'm a science artist and actually current grad student at um, in uh, philosophy of science at University of Leipzig and I'm really looking forward to this talk today. Um, who else do we have? Shauna and Chris. And then that, so maybe Shauna first and then Chris you Shana? can yeah. introduce yourself and take mm -hmm. it away. Hi my name is Shanna and I'm a, a mathematician and um, will be grad student in the fall but I've been doing all this stuff and Chris and I are working on a couple cool things and uh, I support him. Anyway hello. <laughs> Cool. So Chris, welcome. Thanks for joining us. And we are look at hello, Stephen. So Chris, um, feel free to just introduce yourself and take it away with a presentation. Okay, thanks, Daniel. Thanks for inviting me to uh, suggest a paper and join you for this discussion session today. Um, I wanted to start with just a quick um, <clears throat> presentation to provide some background context on this paper, which is about context, uh, written by myself and, and Jim Glazebrook, who is a mathematician. Uh, we've been working together several years. We actually uh, connected and started working together because we were both interested in the perceptual and attentional phenotypes that one finds on the autism spectrum. And that's where we encountered uh, Carl Thurston, actually, and the whole active inference framework in some of his papers on autism. So uh, let me just start this little presentation, and that'll give some background for discussion. Here we go. Okay, as I said, just some, some context for uh, this paper about context. And let's see. Okay. 
So am I still good on, on vision and hearing and all that? Looks perfect. Daniel? Thank you. Okay, cool. So um, here's a standard picture from Carl Friston on the theory of active inference. Uh, it describes the interaction between some system that has internal states and some system that has external states. And the, the interaction is mediated by sensory states and, and active states so that form a Markov blanket. And when I first encountered this, um, it seemed like a, a very nice modern statement of uh, ideas that I would trace back to robotics initially uh, in terms of the, the learn slash explore distinction that one finds in, in developmental robotics especially. And, and even from there uh, back to the basic theory in, in ethology where you have the approach avoid distinction um, approach uh, being very similar to explore, to acting on the world in order to learn something, and avoid being um, a state in which the organism backs off and tries to figure out what it did wrong. So the, the theory has a very rich history, and I think what its, what its current formulation, uh, due to Friston and his colleagues, brings to it is a large body of applicable formalism. And in fact, I would characterize the theory of active inference as it's been presented as perception and cognition from a physics perspective. And the presentation of the theory thus far has been primarily in the language of classical physics. And I think that the language of classical physics is actually seriously unsuitable for talking about active inference. It's complicated and messy. And so what I'm going to do today is provide a little bit of background from a, from a more quantum theory perspective. And I consider today just starting with a, an introductory talk about quantum theory, but I that won't give us quite the background that we need for this. So um, I won't be quite so um, straightforward about quantum theory, but I am I'm happy to answer any questions about it and can go on and on about it, as, as Shana knows. Um, so what I really want to to do is give you another way of looking at active inference which I would characterize as physics from the perspective of perception and cognition. So taking the idea of observation and reformulating physics using that idea. And you'll recognize from the paper there's a, um, a cocone diagram that's sitting uh, next to something that looks a lot like a Markov blanket. So the cocoon diagram represents the internal state of some system. And the external state is completely unspecified. All that's happening out there is some dynamics. And the job of system A is to uh, learn as much about system B as it can in order to make good predictions. So this is still active inference just from a different point of view. And looking at, at it this way, it gets us into a, a cloud of issues that are all related. And I hope uh, by this little introduction to show you how they're related, at least somewhat, give you a sense of how they're related. And I'll, I'll start this, this cycle with system identification, um, which is the old problem from engineering and cybernetics of figuring out what system you're working with. And in physics, this is typically just taken for granted. And in biology, it's often just taken for granted. Um, but in uh, computing theory, for example, and in what are called device-independent protocols in physics now, it's not taken for granted. System identification is up for grabs. 
Intrinsic contextuality is the topic of the paper, and it has to do with the unavoidable, uncorrectable effects of unknown contextual variables on measurements being made. Now, that's clearly related to the question of reference frames. Uh, how am I making my measurements? And, in fact, the first formulation of contextuality in physics by Cochrane and Specker was about making measurements with different kinds of apparatus and showing that uh, experimental results could vary uh, even for the same observable uh, based on how what other things were measured at the same time. This connects to the frame problem from AI, which is the problem of, of predicting side effects of your actions. So side effects of making a measurement in a particular way would be an example. This gets to the problem of memory. If you're going to predict side effects, you have to remember what you've done. And so you have to ask about what are the side effects of recording your memory someplace, because that's a physical action. And finally, we get to the question of ensemble sampling and the question of what probability actually means. Right? Prior probability is fundamental to Bayesian decision theory, but it becomes problematic to say what does prior probability actually mean. And all of these issues swirl around, at least in my view, one issue, which is the issue of separability. Uh, what does it mean to separate the world into uh, a set of systems that then interact. And separability has a very precise meaning in quantum theory. So um, this is one reason for diving immediately into quantum theory. In quantum theory, the notion of separability is defined uh, in terms of whether a quantum state factors into two quantum states. So if, if I have a system and I can draw a boundary somewhere in it that divides it into two compartments, A and B, then if the joint state, the state of the entire system AB, factors into a state of A and a state of B, then the system is separable. In other words, it's entangled. And entanglement is kind of the natural state of systems in quantum theory, uh, whereas separability is the, the only state of systems in classical physics. So A has a state and B has a state, and we can specify those two states independently of each other if this joint system is separable. That means A and B have identities, and we can talk about their interaction. So I want to go back in history to the 18th century and, and just mention how strange an idea this is. If you think about physics at the time of Laplace, um, he was mixing the kind of atomism of Democritus, the kind of hard sphere, irreducible particle atomism, with the dynamics of Newton. And so Laplace's world was a bunch of atoms, each of which was a hard sphere, a monad, and they were moving around according to Newton's laws. And Newton's laws act instantaneously. So there's no sense in Newton of forces being communicated. The forces are just there. And uh, this is something that Newton was aware of, and here's a quote from Nicholas Geisen, who's, who's been very concerned about this issue of locality in physics. And he, in fact, wrote a beautiful paper pointing out that the passion for locality in physics is very recent. It comes from Einstein. Einstein invented this idea that information travels at a finite speed. And before that, everything happened instantaneously. So Newton understood that um, if you go up to the moon and move a rock, then everybody's weight on Earth changes instantly. Now, that's contextuality. That's a change here that happens unpreventably 
due to completely unknown events happening somewhere else. So intrinsic contextuality is closely linked to non-locality. Now, in Laplace's world of all these atoms obeying Newton's laws, there aren't any boundaries. There are no boundaries around systems like the Earth or you or me. Uh, or a cannonball. So where do those boundaries come from? Well, in a Laplacian world, they have to be imposed from the outside. So we impose a boundary, we slice this picture in two, and we say those are two different systems. Now, if you think about that in classical physics, that means that you've created an infinite potential that separates the particles from each other and prevents the Newtonian dynamics from mixing them up. And Frank Tipler several years ago wrote a beautiful paper published in PNAS showing that if you just start with Laplacian physics and you remove these singularities, the boundaries around objects, you get quantum theory automatically. So Laplace, in a sense, had a theory very much like quantum theory, and he had a notion of the universe very much like entanglement. It was full of what Einstein would later call spooky action in the distance. Okay, so in this picture where we start with the system and we slice it down the middle and call the two parts A and B, we're assuming that there's a boundary there. It's not given to us by the physics. And we're assuming that it stays constant over time. And in quantum theory, unlike classical physics, uh, the dynamics will automatically erase this boundary. So quantum dynamics of an isolated system is unitary. And so it mixes everything together into a superposition. So if we say that A and B can be separated, uh, what we're effectively assuming is a weak local interaction that's only well-defined for a short period of time, because eventually the dynamics of the, of the joint system will erase the boundary that we've put there. Okay, but if we have a separable system, and if it's finite dimensional, we have a perfectly general way of talking about the interaction. We can always write, write the interaction in this simple summation form. Uh, the, the whole system interaction, which I'll call HAB with parentheses, is the sum of what A is doing and what B is doing and then how they're interacting. And this interaction can always be written in the form that, I give, that I've given below, which is basically a bunch of thermodynamics, numbers of degrees of freedom and KT and some measure of efficiency, times a sum of operators, and those operators, uh, we can choose a basis where those operators have binary outcomes. So they question, they, they correspond to asking yes, no questions, which is what John Wheeler uh, postulated the very foundation of physics was, just answers to yes, no questions. But we can always do this in quantum theory. And that's why quantum theory is so nice. It allows us to uh, write down a formalism that explicitly describes the interaction between two systems in terms of uh, exchanging information. And this depends on um, an insight that Boltzmann had in the 1870s, and it's really this insight that, that gives us quantum theory. Boltzmann realized that information always costs energy. And what this did was rule out um, the, the way of thinking about measurement that one finds in classical physics, which is that the observer is completely detached from the system. And information flows from the system to the observer, but, but that process of observation doesn't affect the system. And Boltzmann realized that this simply wasn't true. Observers aren't gods. Uh, if I want to get information, I need to spend some energy. 
and that energy flows back into the world. So by getting some information, I'm always affecting what's going on. So uh, from a formal point of view, these operators, uh, the MK, implement both perception and action. And that becomes key, of course, to understanding active inference, because active inference is about getting information and giving information by acting. Okay, so to sum this up, whenever I have uh, a bipartite system that's finite and it's separable, uh, I can write the interaction as thermodynamics times questions, and that looks just like classical communication. Uh, I can think of my two systems as agents, Alice and Bob, they're always called, and they exchange bit strings, finite bit strings. So now, let's think of a specific model. Let's suppose that Alice and Bob are each um, alternately preparing and then measuring the states of a bunch of independent qubits, quantum bits. And we can think of those as electron spins or something like that. So uh, Alice, in some time, uh, prepares in electron spins, and she hands those to Bob, and Bob measures them. And then... Bob writes a message by preparing the electron spins in some way and hands them to Alice and Alice measures them. So they've now exchanged some bits. But there's no requirement that they use the same z-axis to measure the spins. So if they use exactly the same z-axis to measure their spins, then if Alice writes 1001, Bob is going to measure 1001. But if Alice and Bob are using different z axes to measure their spins, Alice will write 1001 using her z axis, and Bob will get some probability distributions over 1 and 0 for each qubit, measuring it with his axis. And the way those probabilities will look will depend on how tilted his z-axis is with respect to Alice's. So this is now an interesting situation. And this gets to Daniel's question about Shannon information versus other kinds, information with semantics. This is a purely quantum uh, system. Uh, there's nothing to introduce any classical noise. So the information exchange is perfectly symmetrical and completely free of classical noise. But by using different reference frames, they introduce quantum noise. And specifically what they lose is the message. They, they lose the semantics from the message. So Alice encodes four bits, Bob gets four bits, but the code may have been lost. And the code resides in the z-axis. If they're using the same z-axis, they share a code. If they're not, they don't. So semantics depends on shared reference frames. And that's what Shannon information theory is missing. It's missing the idea of the reference frame that's used to decode the message. It's just counting bits. So Shannon theory is just a quantitative theory of bits, a way of counting bits. And what we're really interested in is decoding, encoding and decoding. So we're really interested in reference frames. And that will be a central theme. It is a central theme in the paper. Okay, so sum up. Every interaction between finite systems and a separable joint state can be represented in this way. Uh, two agents, and they're separated by a set of bits, a set of qubits. That set of qubits can be thought of as a holographic screen. Uh, it functions as a Markov blanket. And the information that encodes is completely specified. It's the eigenvalues of the interaction written in its Hamiltonian form. So we know everything there is to know about an interaction in terms of a picture like this. And these pictures are uh, everywhere um, in biology. Um, everyone is now using the market Markov blanket concept. Uh, it's very common. In computer science, exactly the same concept is called an application programming interface. 
and it can be plunked down between two virtual machines and regulate their communication. Uh, in cosmology, the holographic principle was originally invented to deal with um, stretch horizons of black holes. So it separates the exterior from the interior and it specifies exactly how much information can be obtained if you're an observer on the exterior about the interior. And it's symmetrical, so it also specifies exactly what the interior can learn about the exterior. But you also see this concept in particle physics. If you're thinking of a, a scattering interaction, for example, that's mediated by a vector boson, a photon, or something like that, uh, say it's electromagnetic scattering, then all of the information is on that vector boson. There's no information about, um, say, entanglement on one side that's communicated to the other side. It's, it's just a single value, uh, a momentum transfer, for example, that's encoded by this holographic screen. Okay, so where do we take this? If we have an observer and she's got a holographic screen and she's interacting with uh, the rest of the universe, Bob, then by looking at her bit string, Alice can learn very little. She doesn't know what z-axis Bob is using, so she gets a message, but she doesn't know what code Bob used. Uh, she doesn't know how big Bob's state space is. So Bob could be a small system, could be an enormous system. Um, since she doesn't know the state space, she can't possibly know Bob's state. She doesn't, she doesn't know whether Bob's state is separable or entangled. So whether there are any divisions in Bob that she has to worry about. Uh, she doesn't know the dynamics on the other side, so she can't predict what Bob will do next. And all of this is in principle. Uh, looking out at the world, I actually don't know that there are any separate objects in it. I can't, based on the information that I can get at my boundary which is just a set of interaction eigenvalues. And so these questions have to be answered some other way. They, they can't be answered by observation. They have to be answered by a generative model. So hence, active inference is based on what models predict. And what quantum theory tells us about generative models is that they're heuristic by definition. They can't be constructed based on the data. They're only heuristics. So where did they come from? And here, when we look back at our picture, our original picture of a joint system being divided, I uh, recall that this boundary is arbitrary and it doesn't last very long. So this joint state isn't separable for very long. And the only asymptotic dynamics, the only dynamics that's long lasting is the joint dynamics. So Alice's generative model, which is implemented by her dynamics, is effectively a sample of the joint dynamics. It's just a temporary sample of what would be going on anyway, if there was no division. So it makes sense that Alice's generative model contains information about the world, but that information did not come from observation. It came from the time before the boundary was imposed. And it will still be there after the boundary goes away. Okay. Um, another thing that quantum theory adds to the active inference picture is that it recognizes that all of the energy that's required to run the calculations also has to come through the Markov blanket. So if you think about the states on um, a holographic screen, a Markov blanket, um, any information encoding, if that interface is the only interface between the two systems, which is how we've defined it here, then some fraction of those bits can't be informative because they have to be burned as fuel. So by definition, they're meaningless. Now this tells us, again, something very deep, which is that the context of a measurement uh, can never be specified completely. 
And that again is in principle because some of the information on the blanket has to be burned as fuel. And we see this on the output side too, of course. Uh, some of my output on the world, some of my action on the world is just dissipating what for me is waste heat. And I have no control over that. That's part of my metabolism. Uh, but I'm side affecting the world all the time by dissipating this waste heat, which I don't think of as an action, but which is an action from the point of view of the physics. So here again, we have an, an addition to uh, the theory that we get from thinking about the dynamics from a quantum physics point of view instead of a classical physics point of view. Okay, so this is the picture I showed before. Uh, the set of qubits is the Markov blanket. Uh, the generative model is represented by this cocone diagram. And uh, it becomes clear what the generative model is. It's a combination of a reference frame and some combination, some computation. And it's clear what it does. It specifies the option space for both perception and action. It encodes everything that's detectable and everything that's actionable uh, about B for A. So here are just a couple of cartoons. Uh, for example, if Alice looks out on the world and what she sees is a red rectangle interacting with a green diamond by some uh, interaction, then she must have reference frames for seeing rectangles and diamonds and she must have uh, state observables for red and green, and she must have a memory so that she can keep track of what's going on with those state observables long enough to construct this picture of an interaction. So all of the semantics is inside the observer. It has to be provided by these structures inside the observer. So the semantics that's imposed on the world is imposed. It comes from the generative model. Uh, it's not out there in any sense. Part of, of what the observer has to do is write memories if the observer is going to see change. And since memories are classical data, those memories are effectively written back in the blanket because the blanket is the only place where any classical data live. So we can, we can infer from this that if a memory looks internal to a system, uh, that system has to have inner compartmental boundaries inside it to, to write those memories on. So this actually tells us something, gives us an expectation about physiology in organisms or in any sort of artificial structure that memories have to be written on boundaries of some sort. So again, here's this, this swirl of issues that all surround this question of separability, of the world being separated into distinct pieces. And I've mentioned all of them now except the frame problem, which is the problem of predicting side effects. And uh, clearly, if you don't have access to the dynamics outside you, and you don't have access to all of your actions, because some of them are just heat dissipation, you can't possibly predict side effects, all side effects. So the frame problem is unsolvable in principle in this uh, setting. So in this paper, what Jim and I set out to do was to construct a general representation of these reference frames. And because they're physically implemented, they're quantum reference frames. They're not just abstracted. And these things specify both what the agent can expect and what the agent can do. So they completely define the option space for active inference for the agent. So by having a general representation of the agent's reference frames, we know, in a sense, everything interesting to know about the agent. Then we wanted to distinguish the reference frames that can be used simultaneously. And these are the co-deployable reference frames from those that can't. And the distinction, again, is given to us by quantum theory. It's just operator commutativity. 
So, for example, I can't uh, deploy position and momentum at the same time because uh, those operators don't commute. Uh, they side effect each other. Is the other way to think of it. And physics is full of operators that don't commute. So, uh, my my action space is is not unitary. It's segmented into uh, sets of things that I can't do at the same time without introducing contextuality. <laughs> um, so we showed that this non-co-deployability of reference frames actually induces intrinsic contextuality as it's defined in the literature. Um, what that means is that it creates undefined joint probability distributions. Um, not just probability distributions that are difficult to make sense of or that need some information added to them, but uh, probability distributions that actually can't be consistently defined. Why not? Because there's the information that would have to be specified to make them well behaved is information that you can't have, that you can't get, even in principle. And then our final objective was to tie this explicitly to the frame problem, which is a canonical problem in artificial intelligence um, discovered by McCarthy and Hayes back in 1969, the unpredictability of side effects. So that's that's it for my introduction, kind of context setting, and I um, am happy to, um, as soon as I can get to this button again, switch to discussion. Chris, thank you so there much it. for that. There it is. Yep. We got it now. Thanks so much for that really amazing presentation. I'm sure everybody was having some pretty interesting thoughts from what you were communicating. Really, though, thanks again for coming on the stream. So um, for those who are here, please write down your questions. And then when you ask your question, let's stop after the question so that we can get a response to that question and not continue on with the question. And then we'll raise our hands to hear from everyone. So I'm going to first ask a question from the chat, and then Stephen, I saw you raise your hand. So anyone else raise your hand? Otherwise, there's a couple questions from the chat. So here's a first question from the chat. Can the context-based paradigm, especially quantum contextuality, help to answer how does spontaneously generated thought arise in the brain? If yes, how? How do you see this related to the brain? <laughs> um, good question. <laughs> Um, I actually suspect that all cells are quantum computers and that to, to really get a handle on information processing in cells, we'll eventually have to use uh, quantum information theory. And the, the reason for that is that cellular energy budgets are really small and and place a pretty strict upper a strict upper limit on how much classical information cells can encode and that upper limit is much much smaller than the information required to encode things like protein conformation so i think that that cells are in fact uh, devices where contextuality and entanglement play a role. Now, what, what spontaneous thought means, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm um, very sympathetic to the idea that uh, thoughts are and emotions and, and everything else that we experience uh, just the experience tip of a very large iceberg that we don't experience. <laughs> so I think our experiential access to what our minds are doing is extremely limited. And um, so how, how what we actually experience, as it, as it were, rises to the surface is uh, a good question. Uh, 
I tend to think that global workspace type theories are a good classical answer to that. Um, but all of those ideas, I think, will eventually need to be put in a, um, a much better mathematical framework. Thank you for the answer. That's so, a long way of saying I don't know. <laughs> but it's what spontaneously came to mind. So how could we ask for anything else? Uh, <laughs> Stephen, and then anyone else who wants to raise their hand. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was just curious, um, you mentioned sort of the quantum noise and the, the, the way that if you um, have the z-axis, um, that you if you don't have the z-axis, you can't decode back the information. And often with quantum effects, it's like it's when you have very low uh, degrees of freedom for a, a, like a molecule or something that you particularly can see it compared to you know, when it's in the milieu of many degrees of freedom. So I'm wondering if there's like a um, certain scales where like the, the interactions are in the cell or molecules are very quantum like and then it becomes more contextual and a bit more blurry and then another scale it becomes a bit, bit more quantum like maybe once you start to get to brain waves interacting and is the contextuality piece moving it in a way, it's another way of moving it in and out of a more classical um, kind of noisy space um, so that it's like where it's got more um, noise and it's less easy to see sort of more distinct quantum effects. So I was wondering, like, is there particular scales at which you see the quantum effect being more like you think of traditional quantum, like flipping between states? Um, and if there's other scales where it's much more like Friston talks about this kind of non-linear milieu. Great. Yeah, that's that's a very good question. It's the question about is there a quantum to classical transition, and if so, where? <laughs> and um, that that question is typically posed in terms of decoherence. And in in Biological systems um, estimates of decoherence times are anywhere from femtoseconds down. Um, there's the famous paper by Tegmark from 2000 uh, criticizing the Hameroff Penrose theory, where um, his argument against Hameroff and Penrose is basically that decoherence happened many orders of magnitude faster than than any cognitive processes or any neuronal processes. So based on that type of reasoning, um, bio, biochemistry is thought of as being classical somewhere above the, say, femtosecond type of time scale. So molecular dynamics calculations are basically classical when they're in like femtosecond types of time steps. And that introduces the question of what is noise, right? What, what does it mean to say that there's thermal noise in a system? Um, when we think about thermal noise classically, for example, we might think about a protein that's sitting in a, a, a bath of water and the water molecules are thermally excited, so they're banging into the protein like little billiard balls. And that's, in fact, one way of thinking about a decoherence model. So what we've introduced here is this idea of a temporal sample, that we're looking at the protein molecule for a long enough period that the water molecules have had a chance to bang into it from many different directions. And we're somehow averaging over that temporal sample. So that gets to this question of, ergodicity that came up in the earlier discussion. Um, and it, it makes us ask, how am I implementing this, this temporal sample? And the, the obvious answer is, I'm implementing this temporal, temporal sample by measuring the state of the protein in a particular way. So I'm, I'm using an enzyme, say, to, to measure the state of the protein. And the 
the enzymatic reaction has some particular time constant. So it takes a certain amount of time for the enzymatic reaction to take place. And during that time, the protein may be wiggling around. So I think that, that all of these questions about classicality in the end come down to questions about measurement. And the temporal resolution of measurements implemented by something, an instrument or another part of the biological system or um, an observer of some kind. So uh, this, is a, this is kind of a long way of saying that I suspect that this question of classicality is always a question of observation. And the, the sort of quantum picture that I, that I outlined implies that the classical information only exists on the Markov blanket, that there's no classical information anywhere else in the system. So classical information may not, in a sense, be ontological at all. There may be no ontological classicality, uh, if this kind of communication picture is correct. Now, if that's the case, noise is um, epistemological. <laughs> noise is, a, is an artifact of making the observations in a certain way with a certain reference frame, right? An instrument is just a reference frame. Thank you for the deep answer, Chris. We're going to go blue, Scott, and then a question from the chat. Hi, Chris. Thanks for the um, contextualization talk. That was really nice. Um, so I just was wondering, you just mentioned earlier, like the prospect of each cell being a quantum computer. And I'm also like, I have a similar kind of thought or theory. And I just was wondering if you've heard of like quantum cognition and the Posner molecule with the idea of these entangled pyrophosphates uh, as, as holding um, kind of quantum cognition cellularly. Have you heard this theory? And do you think it's credible or do you have other um, suppositions as to where this quantum cognition could occur intracellularly? Um, I, I've certainly um, heard and seen various studies of localized uh, quantum effects in particular molecular structures. Uh, so uh, stacked pi domains and, and so on. And, and there's the whole story about uh, is there quantum coherence in, um, um, goodness, I've just dropped the word, light harvesting molecules or electron transport or something like that. And um, you know, there's the Hamroff's theory that there's that there's quantum processing in microtubules, and in all of these approaches, one is thinking about a quantum process happening in a background of a classical cell. One's one's thinking of the rest of the of the biochemical situation as being classical, a classical environment of some kind, in which this single quantum process is happening. And as I sort of expressed in, in answering the last question, I, I suspect that that entire way of thinking is probably wrong. That we, we can't actually think of bulk biochemistry as being classical. So um, trying to think of a particular uh, event as being a quantum event against a classical background um, may just be misleading us about what's how information processing is actually occurring. I mean, if we think of, of the interior of a cell, say the entire interior of something like a bacterial cell, as being in one coherent state, then um, it's not that, that there are particular quantum molecular states. It's, it's that the entire interior is one big entangled mess. <laughs> that 
demands a very different way of thinking about biochemistry. And I don't even know how to formulate uh, that way of thinking about biochemistry. But I suspect that approaching it as a, as a quantum information problem where we're extremely explicit about where measurements are made um, would be what would have to be done. Thanks, Chris. Really amazing about the relational and the semantic biochemistry. That's not how we got it in 103. So Scott, and then a question from the chat. Chris, thank you. That's an absolutely fascinating presentation. There are a number of questions, but I'll just ask one or two. <laughs> um, one of the uh, challenges of quantum physics, or challenges to quantum physics, being applied in the macro level is that you know t don't take people have said don't take the concepts and apply them to social constructions and things like that but here the um origin of the active inference notions or the relationship to the active inference notions suggests to me um the, the opportunity to look at phenomena at much larger systems larger scale and social scale um and so i wonder about your um, uh, acceptance or um, enthusiasm for that notion of applying these ideas to uh, social systems, political systems, economic systems, other systems that have interactions that can be described with active inference. Um, and this feels to me like a nice way to say, hey, we're talking about quantum politics, quantum <laughs> markets. We're talking about uh, prionic governance with conformational changes of narratives. Um, and so a lot of the work that we've been doing on the information side is going to, is I've been saying without knowing, you've explained to me what I've been trying to say for years now in this talk. And it, I've been saying without knowing why that data plus meaning equals information. And the meaning part is what you just explained to me, what I meant by meaning. And I always thought of it, I was a lawyer for 30 years, so I always thought of it as the meaning like a contract with an enforceable narrative, which is meaning. But you've just given me a new way of looking at that meaning from a quantum perspective, which is extremely robust and scale independent. I just wonder about your comments on that and your enthusiasm for that kind of application. Thanks. Oh, uh, thank you. That's, that's a very interesting observation. Um, I think the experiments are going to be very difficult. But I think if we can figure out how to do the experiments, <laughs> we're going to find uh, contextuality and entanglement kinds of effects all over the place. And I would, I would point you to the work of, of uh, Etabar Zafarov and his colleagues, some of which is um, referenced in the paper. In, in their formulation called contextuality by default. What they've done is translate the kind of most standard model of quantum contextuality into classical probability theory. And, and given this criterion of uh, if a classical probability, a consistent classical probability distribution cannot be defined over a set of data, then it displays contextuality. And they, they published a series of papers in the past four or five years on this approach. And one of them deconstructs a large number of claims of quantum effects in psychological data. Uh, which have been reported now by numerous groups around the world with various kinds of experimental protocols. And there's active controversy between members of these different groups about what is and is not evidence of quantum behavior. It's, a, it's an enormous literature now. But using the contextuality by default approach, uh, Zafarov and uh, colleagues um, his student Cervantes is one of the lead people who's done this work, have constructed extremely careful experiments 
where under their their best criteria, there are robust intrinsic contextuality effects. And interestingly, they have to do with meaning. So one that we refer to in the uh, in the paper is called the Snow Queen experiment, and it's based on uh, interpretations of the Hans Christian Andersen story. So I think that as as the tools and techniques for developing these these kinds of experimental protocols are improved, uh, we're going to see more and more uh, effects that are very, very difficult to challenge from a statistical point of view. I mean, the problem is, as Zafroff and I'll point out, is that in physics, if I'm doing something like a Bell experiment, I can put my two observers far enough apart that they can't communicate just due to the speed of light and the time it takes to do the experiment. And you can't do that in biological systems. So you always have this communication loophole to deal with. And what what Zafarov and, and colleagues are really trying to do is develop the statistical analysis techniques uh, to get around the communication loophole in an arbitrary experiment, you know, carried out with college undergraduates. As the and I think they've been successful. Thanks for the response. So we're going to go to a question in the chat. And then if anyone here who hasn't raised their hand yet raises their hand, otherwise we'll go back to um, someone who has. So this is from Sudakar in the chat. How will an agent acquire information for their generative model? You've uh, said that there has to be some heuristic to infer the information even from the joint world. And you said that the object semantics have to be inside the observer. But how does the observer learn that in the first place for their generative model? That's that's an excellent question, and again, I the only answer I can give is I don't know. <laughs> uh, but I think that I think that biology gives us hints. Um, if you look at the process of cell division, which is one of the best examples of of separation that we have to deal with that, that we can really manipulate in the laboratory. Then, and if you ask how much information is, is shared between the daughter cells, well, clearly their genomes are shared, but the genome is only a very tiny part of the shared information. Um, they also share information that's encoded in their cytoskeletons. They share information that's encoded in the cell membrane. They share information that's encoded in the cytoplasm itself. Uh, they may share aspects of their bioelectric states. Uh, so there's a lot of information that is inherited, if you will, across cell division. And most of it has not been quantitated in, in any reasonable way. I mean, it's easy to quantitate the information in DNA or protein but it's extremely difficult to quantitate this other information. And I'll just give you one example of, that's from my colleague Mike Levin's lab at, at Tufts. They work on uh, regeneration in planaria. And they've been able to show um, experimentally that it's been known, it's been known for quite some time that if you alter the the uh, ability of cells to communicate bioelectrically, then you can get planaria to regenerate with two heads instead of one. But what Mike's lab was able to show is that this is epigenetically heritable. So planaria that look perfectly normal may have inherited the tendency to regenerate with two heads after injury. And this happens without changing DNA, without changing RNA, without changing protein content, without changing any of the kind of obviously heritable uh, factors. And um, 
have been able to show experimentally that the bioelectric effect happens first before any observable changes in gene expression. So here's a case where a completely uh, unlooked for kind of information is epigenetically inheritable and makes a huge difference to what the animal does uh, with, its, with its physiology, with its anatomy. I mean, the, the two-headed planaria have two perfectly good operational brains that are independently able to direct behavior. Uh, so they're, they're pretty weird creatures. Thanks for the response. And just briefly, that's one reason why the information is in the genome kind of Zoolander take doesn't work well, because that's assuming there's this map between the source code and the program. But then there's these alternate stable states that exist because of the semantic or the epigenetic or the environmental frame. So it's not quite as simple as just this one mapping that you made. So that's a really nice point. All right, we're going to have Sarah and then Shauna and then a question from chat. Thank you. Go ahead, Sarah. Yeah, I, um, I have almost like two different questions or directions, and I'm not sure how they're going to match. So I'll just start with one and see where it goes. Um, one, it, it seems to me like the, the, the way you frame the quantum um, setup, you know, you have A, you have B, you could actually kind of do this with any prob it's probabilistic type notation that you're using. But, you know, you have A, you have B, they have the joint distribution of the two. And um, it seems like I guess the question that comes to my mind is like, what happens when we don't, if if we were hypothetically, because I know our world is constructed around reductionism, but if we were hypothetically able to separate out or to not think of things as um, reductionist, you know? And so like, for example, um, how would our, how could our math possibly be different if we were looking at things as only spanning sets rather than eigenvalues and eigenvectors um, yeah, so this is kind of where my mind goes is like, is there a, is there even a kind of a way to approach a problem purely through contextuality rather than, than, you know, reductionism of any kind? That's, yeah. Hmm. Um, I don't know. On the, on the math front, I may actually defer to Shauna here because <laughs> as a, she, she does know much more category theory than I do, and I suspect the answer is a, a category theoretic type of answer. Um, but I'll make one comment, which is that wow. reductionism is one of these complicated words that has many different meanings for many different people. But uh, one way to think about uh, what we're doing in quantum theory is merely labeling. And we're, we're labeling things for convenience with the full understanding that our labels, in a sense, don't have any physical meaning. They, they only have meaning in the context of particular observational outcomes that we've made by measuring things in a certain way. But that in itself is a problematic statement, right? And this is, this is in a sense the core of the Copenhagen interpretation. It's, it's what Bohr talked about in his paper in Nature in 1928. Uh, he basically said at the end of the day, uh, we have to talk about apparatus and we have to talk about colleagues, and we have to talk about classical communication. And in a sense, quantum theory tells us that all of that is um, a poor approximation. But it's the only language that we've got. <laughs> so uh, I, I think this, this question of of how far can we go without uh, reifying separation is a very good question. And, and as usual, my answer is I don't know. Awesome. Thanks for the response. Do you have any thoughts, Shauna? Yeah, let's go to Shauna. Oh, yeah, tons. I wonder if I should um, 
ask my two. Yeah, category theory is re really powerful. And when Chris says there's only one logic, no, no, no. He and I are trying to find another one, something called like a chromatic types. And I was actually going to ask you, Chris, if you think, you know, the phenomena of regeneration, I think, could actually be modeled by when we're trying to do that chromatic filtration, right? It seems like regeneration seems to be some kind of um, um, morphism equivalent of when the stop mechanism is. What does it mean to stop? Maybe that means stop means not making more morphisms. And the two-headed mm -hmm. planera like actually has a two category structure, right? That has a one morphism and a two morphism. And I think that's what's controlling the central nervous system, right? That it, uh, if you can have two morphisms and you could have this double head kind of thing. And so whatever the stop mechanism is, I think it's almost like Remember when I was showing you those filtrations, how you could actually mm -hmm. make more equivalences and more equivalences using that boost field localization. So I think, you know, there's another one called the topological localization, where the objects in the categories are reflections. And that might be what might help um, Sarah a little bit, is that there's different categorical uh, models for interaction. Anything interaction-based should be immediately category theory. I think the tensor network stuff fails because like a node is just a point, but in category theory, you can add space to that point by making the point something else. And then you're working in this moduli space. So that was my thought that about um, like spawn and you know, when you were talking about spontaneous thoughts, whoever had a question about that. And then I also think that like our work on the profinite condition, Chris, could also account for like thought, whatever that is, right? Because um, the thought doesn't really last, right? Vo speech doesn't last. The speech fades based on the composition of the molecules in the air, but something remains. I mean, we all continue. It seems to be that holographic copy of the profinitely many, right, in the diamonds and stuff. So I just want, so for Sarah, yeah, I, you know, I think a bunch of this category theory could really help you with, uh, you know, uh, you know, so it's like, you have this object in topology called like a sheaf, which is this very, very complex structure, but it attaches to a topological space. And it's like a little bag and it keeps track of all the data, you know? And uh, so if each space has these structures attached to it that keep track of what happens locally, you can look at the moduli space and the isomorphism classes of those little bags. So what's happening in the isomorphism space of the little bags probably seems to be what this like global consciousness things is. So you can, upgrade that one dimension using category theory and you can work in a stack and a stack is going to be a sheaf that doesn't take values in sets anymore all of quantum theory is taking place in sets and i think it needs to be a little bulldozed like it needs to go up if you can take values in categories then in each point you have so much more space to move around right so then if you actually have this object that takes values in categories and not in sets then you've allowed yourself more space so that you could have these phenomena like the the planera and stuff like that but if you're just working in like uh like points <laughs> and like dots and like nodes connecting i think it's just not enough but you can do all these other things but um i'm not sure if i answered anything but yeah chris i think that regener i was going to ask if you thought like our which we need to pick back up the chromatic you know our, our chromatic type over a temporal logic if that could actually work with this you know i'm fascinated by the regeneration and the stop mechanism which is weird you know. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll just quote Mike Levin, <laughs> telling telling me over and over again, and everyone else who will listen that the most important question in biology is when to stop. Yes. <laughs> now, how 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 does how does the embryo know that it's done? Now I can stop. I'm an adult. No one knows, and, and right. that the question even isn't even asked that way. But when you think about it, it becomes it, it is a key question because it's it's related. When you said like uh, our experiential phenomena uh, capacity is just this, you know, the the tip of the non experience. So it's almost like if the stop is the iceberg of everything else, I'd like to see what's the everything else. You know. <laughs> Thanks for these points. It's uh, really an amazing mapping that is rigorous and something that we should be learning more about how the point can be just the tip of the iceberg kind of where it's piercing something that's a lower dimensionality and so what do we do with that so i'm going to go to a question from chat and then hey, I'm gonna... can i ask can i ask a second part of the oh. question i was working with go for it it's this is and feel free to just be like eh, it's not great just just move you know not answer it if it but i i can't help um, but analogize um, something that I just 
yeah, I cannot ever let go, which is um, in electrical engineering uh, or in electronics, essentially, you know, you have this, there, well, in anything, but I, I really like electronics because it's very tangible. You have the real component and the imaginary component of, of, uh, of signal, you know, that goes across an interface. And so I'm always really fascinated by that because it, it always seems like a really good analogy to this thing that we can look at through math or quantum mechanics, but with electronics, you actually have, you know, a thing that you can put on your desk. Um, because you could think of this, 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 this phase change that happens at interfaces as the context. And, and so I've always been interested in, in trying to look at, at that thing that gets lost without looking at the, at the current or the voltage, like measuring at a point, but actually just keeping track of the context as things move across interfaces in a circuit. It's not even a question. I apologize for that. But if it brings up any thoughts, great. Either of you two, um, if you'd like to give a thought, otherwise it stands. And I love how many ideas people are bringing up. This will definitely be an episode for people to re-listen to and make some knowledge network stuff. Yeah. Uh, all I'll say is phase is extremely important. <laughs> phase is important. It's a very, it's like phase according to whom. So Chris and I have really torn apart this reference frame idea, like according to whom. At what point, if phase was like non-local, then everything would be the same thing. But so at what point do you actually have, you know, electronics, you assume that you have a three, that you're like local and stuff. But um, electronics are fascinating. It's still like kind of tangible. But if you work on that, that space that's pre-actualization, I think it's very, just like Chris presented, it's very, very difficult to say who you are, what, what the boundary actually is, and if the boundary, um, like a boundary in mathematics is like a, an asymptote or something, right? So it's like a, a horizon or a Cauchy horizon or something like that. So inside the very notion of a boundary, you already have causality and then this, you know, tensor product and there's all kinds of other tensor, pro there's wedge products and, you know, it's, it's, I think it's really hard to say what a phase is without bringing into play all these other reference frames that are, mm -hmm. um, so fragile. Cool. I'm going to do a question from the chat and then I have a simple question. So the question from the chat is, do you think a reformulation of quantum mechanics is necessary in order to tackle the problem of consciousness or life from a full mathematical generality? I'm mainly thinking of the notion of intrinsic information from Tishby's paper, Information Theory of Decisions and Actions, but also maybe other approaches like self-organized criticality, um, more generally, I'm curious, how necessary is it to bridge our understanding of thermodynamics, information theory, and biology or control theory to have a good understanding? How far along are we, and are there any concrete problems for a mathematician? <laughs> I read what well, they say, that, you know. <laughs> that, that's, that's an omnibus question. Um, it is. I, I, I guess my, my first answer would be yes. Uh, we do need to bridge all those all those disciplines uh, in order to make progress. Um, whether it will tell us something deep about what experience is in some ontological sense, uh, I have my doubts about. Uh, whether it will tell us something interesting about what experience um, in a sense, does how it works. Uh, I think it may tell us something very important about that. But yes, I, I, I do think that these disciplines need to be bridged. I, I think we're at a bit of an impasse that's been imposed on us by the disciplinary structure of science. Thanks for the answer. I'm gonna ask my simple question and then we're gonna go to Stephen and Blue and also Sarah, I know you had some other kinds of questions that were a little bit less about the math. But here's my simple question. Where does active inference come into play? Or for those who are just learning about active inference and curious to how it might be the bridge for all these different areas, um, what do you think active inference is doing here? Well, I, as, I, as I said at the very beginning, I, th I think of active inference in terms of this fundamental decision that that every system has to make all of the time between uh, do I explore, do I act, uh, 
or do I retreat and 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 try to do a kind of postmortem on just what just happened and learn something? So do I modify my priors or do I try to modify my my experience? And I think thinking of active inference in terms of um, what reference frames are being deployed just allows us to pose that question a little bit differently. Um, it allows us to think of the question in the form of, um, do I make another measurement? Do I act on the world? Or do I modify my reference frame, right? You can think of a reference frame uh, like a category, like a cognitive category. So we have cognitive categories like this is a cat and that's a dog and this is a table and this is another person. Um, so modifying a reference frame um, can be thought of as going into your apparatus and, and changing the way it works. You can also think of it as modifying my category, modifying the things I'm capable of seeing. And I, I think you asked in the, in the previous discussion last week, uh, what does the theory say about the, the capabilities of organisms? And are, does, it, does it put a limit on what organisms can do? And I think in a sense, that's the question we're trying to answer. Uh, to, to what extent are, do organisms have flexible capabilities? To what extent can they retool their cognitive systems? Uh, even, if it's, even if it's just E. coli, right? To what extent can, can uh, something like a microbial population retool what it's capable of? And again, biology gives us these beautiful examples in terms of things like lateral gene transfer, where uh, microbes in a community can pass around genes and so can, can change very radically what they're capable of doing. So, I mean, from an active inference point of view, that's a question, uh, do, I, do I keep going? with the capabilities that I've got, or do I go shopping for some new DNA? <laughs> cool. It's like the active turn. We don't know how far or what else, what other stones are going to be turned when we actually start thinking and doing instead of just thinking about doing. So we have Steven, then Blue, then Scott. Okay. Very excited to hear you talking about the work of Mike. Mike Levin, because his work's very, uh, when I saw the video of his work recently, it's like last year, it was like, wow, it started to bring the whole idea of swarming and how swarming actually is underpinning a lot of what happens. And the, 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 the work with bioelectrics is really interesting. And I, I, I've been interested in how, if that bioelectric aspect seems more, maybe more closely tied to the sort of quantum transitions um, and um, just maybe a little clarity on a couple of things, because often just tradition... Let's just yeah. ask the question and then clarify it. Okay. Um, so the question is, um, when you have these quantum effects, you know, normally they may be just, you think of things flipping between one state and another, another state in more sort of basic chemistry, thinking about like energy levels or something like that. But it, you have many levels potentially. So is it a case that you're able to still infer from the noise what's going on with quantum states? Um, and therefore this gives us a way to not have to just go for like the attractor theory and complexity or catastrophe theory or phase theory that we use at the moment, but you're able to still extract quantum state information in ways that's not just classical, like one energy level to another energy level, but you get this more higher information context. Is 
Yeah, good question. I, I think what you're really asking is uh, where are the experimental tools that let us uh, probe this domain? And um, I wish I knew. <laughs> and this is something that Mike and I talk about. For example, uh, how could we go about uh, looking for contextuality effects, for example, in um, th things like bioelectric effects in worm regeneration? Uh, and I don't know. I think I think there's a huge opportunity space here for for people to think about uh, ways of doing experiments that we can't experiments that we can't do now or have never thought about being able to do that uh, probe a, a domain of correlation that is non-classical or super determined or however however you want to think about it and i think that the the more we can think of biological systems in in communication theoretic terms the better prepared we'll be to uh, design experiments to look for what are really communication theoretic effects and quantum theory is really about communication Thank you. Cool. Blue, and then Scott. So, can I have a comment first? Because Shanna dropped off. I don't know if she's gone or if she's going to rejoin, and it's kind of a follow-up to some of the stuff that she was saying, but I can still ask it. Um, but let me pass to Scott, and then I'll go. We'll, we'll go to Scott, and hopefully um, we can have some future category streams to really learn more about <laughs> this area. So, yeah, Scott, and then back to Blue. Great. Um, thank you. This is uh, my, my smile is hurting my face. It's so it's such a great discussion. Um, the two things I want to talk about embodiment and this is and related and one is social level experiments. So the first one is embodiment. It seems like we have these internal states or embodiments of prior external states or their learned states. And so it's kind of interesting because the external states and the internal states have bear a significant relationship through time not just through that individual organism's Markov blanket, but by the inherited and other factors that are become the priors, right? And so it's kind of interesting because you have embodiment externally and internally, maybe that's extremely fluid, right? Because if you're talking about systems at different levels, there are different types of systems, cell systems, social systems, organisms, organizations, they all have different affordances and their embodiments are not necessarily, they can be, um, they're not necessarily inconsistent when they're different. Right, you can have an embodiment of something. Uh, if I eat a lot of fatty food, I become fat, but that doesn't, you know. So anyway, so that's one thing is the embodiment. If we talk a little bit about that, for me, from my perspective, if you're looking at risk and change, when you information being shifted around as a lawyer, ex lawyer, I look at risk and risk being moved around. And so, one of the things that seems to me when you have the embodiment question is that among the relationships, then you get the question since entropy or disorder is going to increase universally. What we're doing is we're um, managing local neg entropy in these systems, right? We're, we're sharing uh, local neg entropy. And so the question is, is that dynamic something that um, tends to dissipate the Markov blanket as a standalone thing? Maybe Markov blankets are a general thing. That's one question. And then okay, the related let's get that. Okay. Let's try to do one question because it's really, you know, in an esoteric so domain. It. Let's just try to, yeah, thanks for the really great yep. question. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. Um, this is a wonderful question. I'll, I'll make uh, two comments. Um, one is in terms of, of reference frames, which I always come back to. Um, I think what, what, what quantum theory contributed to the, to the notion of a reference frame is it insisted that we regard reference frames as embodied, as physically implemented, and stop thinking them, of them as merely abstractions. And we can, we can go back, for example, to the idea of, of cognitive categories. You know, my, my idea of a table <laughs> is not an abstraction. 
It's, a, it's something that's implemented in my brain. And it can be changed by operating on my brain. And I can change it that way. We don't know how that works, right? But, but what, the, what the, the embodied movement or the, the 4E framework, whatever, what, what that forces cognitive science to think, to think about is these are not abstractions. We're talking about things that have been implemented. So I think that's an incredibly important point. Um, the second point I want to make is about boundaries. And I showed that picture of, of uh, right, a Alice looking at her, at her holographic screen and listed the things that she doesn't know. But I could have added to that that Alice doesn't know where her boundary is. Uh, if, if I'm a system and I'm, I'm looking out at the world through my Markov blanket or, or through my, my encoded screen, then what I'm seeing is this array of information that's painted on my screen, right? This array of bits. And, and Friston's point and the point of the holographic principle is I don't see what's on the other side. But you can flip that around. It's always symmetrical. I don't see what's on my side either. And that's, that's why I tried to make this point very briefly about memory. How if we think of memory as classical, then it's got to be written on the screen because that's the only locus of any classical information. So if I'm looking at my screen, the thing that I don't see is myself. And since I don't see myself, and I don't see the other side, I just see the screen, I have no idea where it is. So when you, when you raise this question of um, a social system or, or any other kind of complex system, um, we as, as observers of that system are using our reference frames or our cognitive categories or our however you want to describe them to draw a boundary around that thing. That boundary is our imposition. It's not the system's imposition. The system doesn't know where its boundary is. Is there a thought? Can I ask Paul? Yep. Is there a tautology in there, though? Because that's interesting, right? Because we're using our system. We're drawing the system within our boundary. It seems like that's an intrinsic quality of the thing. That system, can can a system know itself and can a system know others? And you can only know it through the boundary. But you, So you can't know yourself because you're not written on the boundary. So it's kind of a, well, let me, let me get to the next question because it relates to that. So the next question. But the, but, the, but the quick answer to that question is yes. Yeah. <laughs> I like, that's a good question. It's good when there's a binary answer. So the next question was the. In, in, I was wondering if we can, um, if the for experimentation. This is the question of answering experimentation. If and to the extent that this is there's scale independence and active inference, and so that it applies at cell levels and social levels, etc. Why can't we look at the social level to run experiments, and then apply those what we come out with at other levels so it's similar to when you do a qubit at a macro you know they do qubit qubits that are manifested in different ways in different kinds of systems you know ionic qubits and things like that so you can measure them in different ways so we could be observers of the system to at the social level to identify some qualities and the reason i'm asserting that as a lawyer even though the social has a lot of variables what we do as as lawyers is create fewer variables right we take a meaning thing and we say hey everyone in this area of the statute has to behave this way and so then internally everyone can absorb and embody the idea that i know everyone's going to stop at a red light i know i'm going to stop at a red light that's the story of the red light red means stop you're taught it as a kid so it becomes instantiated and kind of axiomatic so one of the things about the law is that i'm going at it from a slightly different way of effectively going in and trying to create non-variables in the Markov blanket that are shared, right? Mm -hmm. And so if, and, and so I wonder about the embodiment relates in a way, I think, to the experimentation question, 
because can we do let's call them artificial embodiments into the internal states through things like law or folkways or shared meaning or norms or things like that that we can then experiment against is what i'm wondering cross-cultural experiments things like that that then may have application at other levels thank you I, I think that's I think that's a fascinating thing to try to follow up on, and um, I, I would say one of my one of the things that seems most mysterious to me is language, is is the very possibility of classical communication of what what you're talking about a physicist would call super determinism, and super determinism of is essentially the same thing as entanglement. Uh, if, if I don't have a choice about what reference frames to deploy, if there's a correlation in advance, super determined uh, by the past, between the reference frames I use and the reference frames you use, then and in an important sense, we're not independent systems anymore. Right? We're, we're entangled. But that's what language is, in, in some sense. Can I and so I, I, I agree with you. We should be able to re-describe communication generally in these terms of, of reference frame sharing, reference frame choice, uh, super determinism and apply some of this math that's been worked out in other places to reinterpret um, communication. And I, I'll, I'll mention a, a paper by a guy named Alexei Grinbaum, a philosopher of science at Saclay. And it's a paper on uh, device independent methods in quantum communication. But the very last, I see, Sarah, you're nodding your head. You probably read this paper. Uh, one of the very last sentences in the paper is, uh, he says, this redefines what physics is about. Physics is about languages. And I think that's a phenomenally profound statement. I think he's right. Nice. Let, let, let's continue in yeah, order. So we got blue and then Stephen, and then Sarah. So uh, Shanna's not here. I think she said in the chat that she um, had to run. But um, I want to touch back on what she said, like when a thought passes, that there's still something there. And also, Chris, to what you were saying earlier about memory and what uh, Sarah was saying of keeping track of what gets lost. And so something that I gleaned from this paper, now I have like no background in category theory at all, um, as you may have been able to tell from the introduction video, right? So, um, the, so it seems like that there's this hierarchical nature of some mathematical summation that is like able to occur like via these methods. And I just was wondering if you're familiar with Eric Hole's work. Um, he put out a paper last year on causal geometry and um, like he's done some coarse graining stuff. And so, so is there some relationship between like that kind of coarse graining or like dimension reduction and this category theory work or is the category theory somehow able to encompass um, the entirety of the mathematical problem in a better way or a different way than, say, coarse graining? Um, <laughs> yeah, good, good question. Um, uh, yes, I, I do know Eric's work, and uh, I talk to him almost every week because he's also part of uh, Mike Levin's lab. And uh, so we... we have discussed this question of, of, of coarse graining and causal emergence and effective information, all of these concepts that, that Eric has been working with, um, I think are very closely related to uh, the, the concepts that Jim and I have been working with. And uh, we're we're coming at them from such different uh, starting points that 
it's not clear, at least to me, exactly how they fit together. Uh, but what a, what a cocon diagram does is coarse grain. Uh, it, it represents a, an abstraction of a set of logical relationships or, or it represents a, a, an abstractions of a, of a set of criteria into a um, coarse grain, larger scale, if you will, uh, criterion that uh, covers all of the cases below it, but in which information is both lost and gained. And I, I think the, the, the best example, at least for me, for thinking about it is, is again going back to cognitive categories. If you think about, you know, your category for a table or another person or whatever, um, you, you lose information in that abstraction process, but you also gain information uh, by tying all of those exemplars together. And uh, each exemplar is then, in some sense, encoding through the rest of the network uh, its consistency, in some sense, with other exemplars that may have different uh, detailed characteristics. So at the token level, they look inconsistent, but at the type level, they're consistent. And the the um, the cocon diagram represents that that very complex relationship. So, um, when one is doing a coarse graining and it works, uh, the the information in the coarse grain state is capturing just this kind of abstract information. It's the, it's the abstract information that's actually useful and that captures what is consistent between the, the, the fine-grained exemplars. Uh, and by organizing them that way, it allows each of them to represent uh, the fact of its consistency with this larger set. Thanks. I also like I'm curious to see because I do think that it's gonna like you guys are will lock together eventually at some mm -hmm. point. Um, you yeah. know, it might be in 10 years, but, but I'm curious to see how that, um, you know, kind of dynamic interplay unfolds. Yeah. Cool. Well, also, <laughs> so <am I. laughs> also, um, Mike Levine will be on active inference live stream on July 13th. So we can talk before then or after then. All right, awesome. So we have um, a little bit less than 20 minutes left. So we'll just do you know, questions and try to get a few more questions in from the chat as well. Steven and then Sarah. Thank you. Yeah, deep breath. There's a lot, a lot to go through here. Um, I was going to sort of build on that coarse grain question and maybe just stepping back at some of the bigger implications of contextuality um, and how that is thought about. So. Um, you know, the principles that you're talking about or the paradigms. Um, so I'm curious about how you see this maybe impacting contextuality um, and the way people think about that. Um, the reason let's, I said, okay. let's, let's address that and then continue, Stephen. But let's just get one question and one answer. Okay, go. Okay, I guess I didn't, I didn't actually hear that as a question. <laughs> Sorry. I Okay, thank you. Yeah, Sorry, Stephen. Yeah, I just I just finished that thought, but basically, just in terms of contextuality and coarse graining, and you know how much granularity is thought about, um, and how that has a bigger that that general idea of how to think about contextuality. Um, I'd be interested in, in your thought about that as how that sort of has a bigger set of legs. And and one of the reasons I say that is because when people often talk about quantum theory in a sort of broader 
world out there, they often think about this transpersonal, it's all the same and it's unifying and it's actually decontextualizing in some ways, you know, it's almost, mm -hmm. in some ways this is quite revolutionary to me to really see quantum effects as being contextual, you know, mm -hmm. being in that way. So, you know, that maybe ties in with David Bohm's work at, at, on implicit order and the, the awareness of things. So rather than always being about the whatness and going up, indigenous approaches are very much about where you are and how you are, what's your embeddedness in your niche. So mm -hmm. in some ways, it's like quantum... Th now, when I first heard about your paper, I was thinking, oh, this is... You hear quantum, you think abstract, but actually it's doing something very different. So I just wondered how that might have impact in other senses. Okay, so... Uh, so I, I heard a, n a number of different ideas here that that are are parts of questions. Uh, one is to do with with course screening and contextuality, and you put your finger very precisely on the danger of course screening. Uh, and this this uh, you can also state this in terms of the frame problem. Uh, it's, it's often the little details that come back to bite you. And when you coarse grain, you're specifically getting rid of those little details. So this is, uh, goodness, it, it, it's like the, the metaphor of the hammer and the nail, right? Uh, if uh, any choice of reference frame is effectively a choice of coarse grain. And choosing a reference frame, choosing a coarse graining determines what you can see. But that also determines what you can't see. And it's what you can't see that is responsible for the contextual effects that you can't avoid by, by, by you know, um, learning more about the context. If you've, if you've arranged your measurement procedures in a way that prevents you from seeing them, then you can never take them into account when you're building your probability distribution. So, so coarse graining is something that we're stuck with, but it's, it's very much a double-edged sword, right? It, it allows us to get around in the world. It allows us to see these similarities. Uh, it allows us to learn things, but it forces us to ignore things that may turn out to be important or may turn out to have been important. Thanks for the um, really interesting answer there. Um, so, so with respect to, to your other question about, if you will, embeddedness, uh, yes, I think that's crucially important. Um, let's go to Sarah and then oh, continue, Stephen. Sorry, I was just going to say, yeah, that 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 whole embeddedness is huge for the inactive ecological cognition work and sort of the the, the pragmatic turn in psychology. So there's there's a lot of implications of that. So I just think that's very exciting. So thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm very attracted to this sort of notion that ecosystems are, are in a sense, extended organisms, etc. That whole way of thinking in, in biology is, I think, very important. And also to uh, connect that, it's like there's this embedded practice, and then we're talking about the physical electronic circuits. So it's almost like across domains, we're taking an action-oriented and a realist manifested focus but then seeing the what is actually manifest as the tip of the iceberg in another sense but it's totally real for what it really is which is our measurement and then also it's the tip of an iceberg because we're also in the system and those kinds of systems don't just arise out of nowhere so sarah and then scott in our last couple of minutes but thanks everyone for this really awesome discussion maybe sarah yeah you had a minute. go ahead yeah um so am I to understand that we have another one of these? Because I, I would love to ask Chris, you know, these other questions, but obviously not now. There's just not enough time. 
we will be discussing the paper next week, but um, we did not plan. So totally Chris. no pressure, but we're we're doing it at the same time next week. But uh, okay. no expectation. Okay. No prior. Okay. Um, yeah, I, in some ways, this is like a media um, just rephrasing what's already been said, but it's actually right up right up your alley, Stephen. Um, I I was actually just in writing in my paper, you know, about well, it, it, what methods you choose depend on what met what questions you ask. Um, it related to reductionism, related to this whole theme. Um, but I, I wonder, this is like super abstract, um, but like I wonder about the, the role of play. Because I was thinking about, you know, like I was thinking about um, that there's so many situations in science where you're not, you know, like at, when you look at the paper, you're like, oh yeah, they're doing science. But in reality, they're just poking at shit, right? Like, so it's just this way of being with the world where you're like, oh, I wonder what happens if I, you know, but they're not really reducing. They're just, it's like, so it's like play. And so I've really wondered about, about how to bring that to the foreground about what that, what that is in science, you know? And so I, again, I apologize, but you're, you always have a way of coming up with a comment. So hopefully you'll have a thought on this. <laughs> Oh, yeah. If it's not fun, you're probably doing it wrong. <laughs> I was just thinking of like an antidote to reductionism. Like play seems like a way that you're not taking things apart. You're just kind of, you're with it in some way. Well, I to take this back to active inference and to, to think of it uh, almost in, in robotics terms, right? Uh, what the people in robot in developmental robotics are, are trying to do is understand what motivates a system to uh, engage with the world with this kind of innocence that I think you're referring to. To to just explore and, and see what's learnable, right? The, uh, the, what, one, of the, one of the key questions is, is um, and Pierre Odier is, is the one who I think in the literature has emphasized this more than anyone else, is how do, how do you learn what parts of the world are learnable with the resources that you have so that you can avoid spending all of your resources trying to learn things that you're not capable of learning so how do you how do you how do you focus your exploratory behavior in the parts of the world where it can actually be productive and this is sort of a meta question on top of active inference and it, it has to do with bayesian precision and things like that uh, but it's your expectations about learnability. And then there's a flip side of this in evolutionary theory, right? The whole idea that, that what organisms are doing in evolution is trying to improve their evolvability. Uh, so they're, they're, they're trying to increase, if you will, the flexibility of their lineage to cope with, with whatever the environment can throw at them. And this is very much, I think, what what's happening in play, as you put it. You're you're trying to to engage with the world in a way that is wanting to know what the possibilities for further engagement are. Thanks for the answer. And speaking to play, it's almost like you start with what you have, the rubber band and the tinfoil. So you start with the actual, but then you you think about what if, and you think about adjacencies, even categorical adjacencies. Um, so that was uh, pretty interesting. So, and then also a comment on what you said about the expectations of learnability in Active Inference Lab. We would hope to learn by doing and applying and update people's expectations to increase their um, understanding of, their, they, they can learn active inference, basically. We'll figure out other ways to say it more directly, but we'll manifest 
through observations on people's screens that they can learn active inference. And then it's almost like in the cognitive dimension, our collective and our individual cognitive evolution will undertake another inflection point when we believe that we can learn. So that will be really powerful. So Scott? Yeah, along those lines, just in terms of further leverage, I want to talk a little bit about the buy or build decision that every organism makes. And the idea is, do you, do you develop it internally or do you get it outside, right? And mm -hmm. so it seems like one of the things that struck me is we talked about the brain being um, tied to language. One of the things I've been fussing with lately, and I, this is the question, I've been fussing with the idea that the mind resides in language and the brain is just an antenna tuned to the mind. Now, the antenna would be the Markov blanket, right? Or the, the action of the Markov blanket is a continuous dynamic tuning. And the so that you're if you're born into a cultural context, if my, my, if my sister adopted a five-month-old Chinese baby. She was raised in central Pennsylvania. She looks Chinese. She doesn't speak Chinese, doesn't like Chinese food. She's not Chinese, right? So her mind is a creature of her environment, embodied. So... One of the things in terms of affordance is, you know, we talk about resources internally to develop the Markov blanket. You know, you can really shortcut that if you say, hey, I know that my resource internally is I should tie myself to, to uh, Daniel because he's awesome and he knows all the stuff. I don't have to know it. I just have to know if I have a question, I'll go ask him. Right. So you start to have this thing like it's like eukaryotic revolution of multicellularity. You start to have this de-risking and leverage at larger scales made possible by the fact of synthesis of multiple Markov blankets. Now, they can be synthesized around common ideas or common problems. So the, the question is, in terms of that, again, that separateness, we see ourselves and our Markov blankets and our minds as separate, but it seems like maybe they're not. Maybe, mm -hmm. it, maybe the mind is all one thing, and we have these instantiations of it that we call different there are different iterations of that Markov language. Could you comment on that kind of macro and micro level uh, notion briefly? Um, I'll try. <laughs> I, I think this is all good thinking. I, I view this in the language of, uh, in a sense, extended organism thinking and evolutionary theory, uh, which is very closely connected to to multicellularity and evolutionary theory, uh, which is closely connected to uh, the sorts of, of uh, uh, facultative multicellularity you see in microbial communities. Um, I think from a from a, I think we see examples of this throughout biology, and. Um, so the question becomes, how do, how do we take this into the human sphere? Or, as, as I think you posed it very clearly, uh, how do we realize that it's already been taken into the human sphere? We just don't quite get it yet. And, and I suspect that you're right, uh, that we just don't quite get it yet. And, and uh, I, I, I remember in graduate school, someone said, what you're, what you're learning is how to read the literature. Yes. You don't need to learn any facts. <laughs> and that has to do with security, right? And, and new forms of threat and integrity and privacy. All these new emerging problems are not necessarily new problems. Okay? And that's why I wondered about the, the biology and the biomimicry you see that we can, how can we actively pursue biomimicry in this space? Mm. Really fascinating discussion. Thank you so much. Cool. Sorry, you're a little quiet at the end there, Scott. But um, with this um, close of the hour, um, Chris, really thanks so much. And also to um, Shauna for joining with your expertise. But really, this was a special event for us. We would always welcome the opportunity to speak with you or colleagues to learn more. And any other final thoughts um, that you'd like to give in closing, Chris? Um, yeah, feel free to send me an email. Uh, my, my address is on my website, chrisfieldsresearch.com. Uh, all the papers I've published recently are there. Uh, but yeah, I'd love to continue discussing. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot. And um, next week, we're going to be having a follow-up discussion to really 
digest this, definitely re-listen to it and um, go from there. So thanks everyone for joining and we'll see you another time.